at Holy Communion, a long-standing conversation about faith, life, justice, arts, culture. Each week, we will premiere a conversation on our channels, and then on the following Sunday, we join in the conversation with Q and A and the chance to engage on the topic. We're so glad you have joined us. Welcome to the forum. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm one of the priests at Holy Communion. And today we're going to continue a series we're calling Theology 101. Uh, for a while now, we've been doing Bible 101, and we decided to get a little bit beyond the Bible to talk about some of the questions of theology, the questions of what it means to be a Christian today. And I'm titling this conversation Membership, Membership Church and Belonging Post- COVID-19. Uh, and I know that we're not post-COVID-19, but I think there are some questions out there, as you'll hear, about what it means to be a member of a church, what church membership looks like. There are worrying trends of decline uh, that you probably have heard talked about in the media and in wider church circles. And so I wanted to talk about what I think is happening and what some of the questions are out there around church membership and belonging. Uh, to do that, I'm going to run us through a few slides. So if you're listening online with us, that's cool. Um, we like having you with us. Uh, but we are going to uh, look at a few slides that will be up available on our YouTube. And on our webpage, I'll post the, a PDF of the slide deck, too, if you want to take a look at some of the quotes and things. So membership, church, and belonging today and post-COVID, whenever that happens to be. Um, the first thing I want to say is, while we are in a new period, um, this question of what does it mean to belong, I think, is a spiritual question. Uh, the social researcher and uh, Episcopalian, Brene Brown, has said that belonging is being part of something bigger than yourself. But it's also the courage to stand alone and belong to yourself above all else. In her book, Braving the Wilderness, she talks a lot about this theme of belonging. And she has found that the question of belonging is one of the questions of our time. And how we belong, the institutions to which we belong, matter. And she talks about her own church membership at Christ Church Cathedral in Houston as an important part of how she practices this belonging in the book. But I want to frame that this is a big question. This is a question that a lot of us are struggling about. And it's not necessarily as simple as we sometimes frame it. I also want to notice that belonging and our idea of membership has shifted before in the church. Um, in the history of Holy Communion, uh, we were actually born as a congregation in uh, 1869 which was a time when there was a lot of shift going on. Uh, you see on the screen here a picture of box pews at a church on the East Coast of the United States. For a long time in the Episcopal Church and basically in every church in the country, um, pews were important uh, because pews signified membership. You literally, your membership was in that you paid a fixed rent for your pew. And so you had an assigned pew number and you rented your pew. And you can see these box pews on the East Coast, they had little doors. Uh, and you had your little pew that was your pew and you could leave things in it. And you were responsible for bringing in your heat in some churches. Uh, but it was your pew for the year when you paid your pew rent. Holy Communion was one of the first churches west of the Mississippi uh, to declare itself a free church, free of pew rent. Uh, and they started the trend that we are continuing this day, which is we're in the midst of our stewardship campaign. Uh, this Sunday, the 5th of December, we're asking people to turn in their pledges. Uh, and the rectors in the past in the Episcopal Church would have simply asked people to turn in their rent checks for pews. But so our idea of membership has changed. Uh, it's changed as a society over the years. What it has meant to be a member of a church has changed. 
And you may have heard some things of that. You may have felt some things in those shifts in what it means to think about membership. But if you don't literally have real estate in the church, if you don't literally have a pew that you're renting, what does it mean to belong? What does it mean to be a member of a church? Well, in the Episcopal Church, we are a sacramental tradition. And so we can't talk about membership without mentioning, about, without really starting there at the sacramental place. Uh, the picture on the screen now is the Bishop of Missouri, Dion Johnson, at Holy Communion back in April. Uh, no, May. It was back in May when Bishop Dion confirmed our and received our latest class of op official Episcopalians. We become memberships of the church through the sacrament. Um, the primary sacrament of membership is baptism. And the Episcopal Church is kind of funny. Um, you talk about changing ideas about membership, really starting at that time of the pew rents and accelerating into the 20th century, this idea that it doesn't matter as much where your membership started, that we recognize all baptized people as Christians, that everyone who is baptized is counted a member of Christ's body becomes really important to the Episcopal Church. Becoming an official Episcopalian means that you're confirmed or received or you're recognized as a member in our particular denomination. But first and foremost, we recognize all baptized people as members of Christianity. And it's a membership that is kind of different than the way that we often talk about membership. When we think about membership, in the world. We often talk about social organizations. We often talk about political parties. Uh, we talk about committees that we're members of, but we mean something pretty fundamentally different with church membership. In the rite of baptism, after somebody is baptized, they're marked with holy oil. They're sealed with holy oil. Um, and the priest or the bishop says, uh, you are marked as Christ's own forever. Your membership is indissoluble. And sometimes people ask me how they can resign their membership in the church, how they can stop being members. And it's an interesting question for an Episcopal priest because I can transfer you to another church. I can move your letter of membership if you request. When we have somebody move and uh, move to another state or move to another parish, I send their letter of membership at their request and sign it and say they were a member here and uh, you know they should have all the um, rights and benefits of a membership in the Episcopal Church in your parish too. You can become an inactive member. We'll talk about um, members in good standing and inactive members on a little bit later slide. But there's no way to make someone not a member. There's no way for us to undo a baptism. Uh, you are marked as Christ's own forever. It's partly when we say that, when we welcome the newly baptized, we're saying that our sacrament recognizes something that is fundamentally true, that you are always God's beloved. And we can't undo that in the church. We can't unmake you a member, which is kind of a unique thing. So beyond sacramental membership, beyond that kind of belonging. Another way the Episcopal Church often talks about membership is what I just said around questions of governance. So the General Convention of the Episcopal Church, which will happen this coming summer in 2022, should have happened in 2021. It usually happens every three years, but COVID pushed it. Um, but it's one of the largest elected legislative bodies in the world. It's the highest level of governance for us in the Episcopal Church. There are communion-wide um, structures, but they don't have authority in any real way. It's, it's ways that we relate to each other, not ways in which we're governed. So membership in the Episcopal Church in terms of active membership means a very specific thing. Um, in order to vote at our annual meeting, um, which is coming up in January, usually the last Sunday in January, uh, to vote for members of vestry or to vote for any resolutions before the congregation, uh, to vote for our representatives to the wider bodies of the church, you have to have your letter of membership at Holy Communion. So if you were baptized or confirmed in another Episcopal church, 
uh, or in a com church in communion with us, like the Evangelical Lutheran Church and the Moravian Church, you have to have moved your membership from whatever congregation you were a member of before to Holy Communion, or you have to have been baptized or confirmed at Holy Communion. Then you have a letter of membership. You have to have communion, and you have to have communion three times, uh, only three times, which I find really interesting. Uh, and it, it's kind of funny because that means you have to have come to at least Christmas, Easter, and one other time uh, to count. So we're, then that's a national canon. So it's not just Holy Communion being lax about how often you have to attend. It's, it's the whole Episcopal Church. So you have to have come to communion three times and you have to be what's called a giver of record. So the pledge is the easiest way to do that. Um, but anybody who writes a check or who puts cash in an envelope and puts their name on it so that we know we have a record that you gave, um, then your membership is considered active. You're considered a, a communicant in good standing, which is generally the requirement to vote. Um, to be elected to vestry, you, often, you have to be 16 years old uh, in the Episcopal Church. That's what the canon set. Um, but those are the only things. Um, we elect members to the higher body of the diocese, the wider body of the diocese, the diocesan convention. We get four lay representatives and then all the clergy of the church are um, members of the diocesan convention. That convention elects the bishop. So just a couple of years ago, we elected delegates to the convention that got to cast a vote uh, and we elected Bishop Dion Johnson uh, as the Bishop of Missouri. The diocesan convention elects members to the general convention. That's the picture here, um, the widest body of the Episcopal Church that meets every three years. And that body is, uh, our, our representation in each diocese is four clergy and four lay. And I'm actually been elected as one of the clergy deputies to the general convention. But so this is a very governmental understanding of membership. There's a very formal, these are the requirements. If you're going to have a vote, we are governed democratically in the Episcopal Church. And so sometimes we can think of membership as a, in a very political, bureaucratic, governmental kind of way. But part of what we're finding is that belonging, membership is shifting. Uh, there's a, a professor, retired now from Harvard, named Robert Putnam, who wrote a pretty famous book, you may have heard of it, called Bowling Alone, where he looked at the ways not just the church is in decline, but all sorts of membership organizations are in decline, from Elks Clubs to, you know, everything, uh, Boy Scout groups, um, neighborhood associations, PTAs. Uh, even political rallies have less attendees these days. But he says that all of our ways of belonging, all of our ways we associate in community are on the decrease. And this book was written 20 years ago now. He says, people divorced from community, occupation, and association are first and foremost among the supporters of extremism. I find that really interesting. This idea that as our civic life has declined, as we've belonged less to organizations, even labor unions, organizations that put us in a wider community, like churches, we have become more prone to extremism. Um, basically, if you don't have to do community with a group of people who don't look like, who don't think like, who are just a crazy amalgamation of people, if you don't have to regularly do community with folks like that, then you can get brought into a silo where you're very, very prone to extremism. How much are we seeing more extremism in these days? So I wanna talk about a couple of ways in which the church is looking at addressing these questions. Um, there is a quote from, this quote at the top is from Dietrich Bonhoeffer a famous 20th century theologian who famously was, um, it was killed by Hitler. Uh, he was, he was part of the um, confessing church in Germany. He was, he escaped uh, the war originally to the United States, taught at Union Seminary in New York, but then went back 
um, and decided that he was going to be part of the church working against uh, Hitler and the Reich. And in the midst of that, as a prisoner of war, he wrote letters from prison and Dietrich Bonhoeffer had a lot to say about the future of the church, even in the early part of the 20th century. And he said this famously, the restoration of the church will surely come only from a new type of monasticism, which has nothing in common with the old, but a complete lack of compromise in a life lived in accordance with the Sermon on the Mount and the discipleship of Christ. I think it is time to gather people together to do this. There are a lot of thinkers in the church that have agreed with Bonhoeffer, including our presiding bishop. At the last general convention, the presiding bishop presented this. Uh, it's called the way of love. And the idea was a rule of life, uh, a set of practices, a way of living out that Sermon on the Mount, a way of living out our values. Basically, that we had to find a way to create a strong set of practices that bound us together, that gave our membership meaning. And so Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, says we all have to learn, pray, worship, bless, go, rest, turn. Uh, these practices I spell out in our pilgrimage class, which is our class for folks who are exploring membership in the church. But we've gotten more insistent about this idea of that being part of a church will make you weird, that being a member means that you do things that may not be a part of something that's in the wider society. You can also see these rules of life um, in other places. The church has been intuiting this for a while. Our baptismal covenant, when we make our promises at baptism, we make promises beyond just you know, what we say with our that we believe. We say we're going to do things, that we're going to seek and serve Christ and all people, uh, that loving our neighbor as ourself, that we're going to seek justice and equity it's a part of, we make a covenant as part of our baptism now, which was new in the 1970s. So there's this idea that church binds us into an ethical community. An alternative community, perhaps. I'm going to um, make my face disappear for those of you who are on the video. So um, this is a quote from Howard Thurman, uh, who was one of Martin Luther King's mentors. Uh, who talked about alternative community. The church is an alternative community. He founded one of the first integrated churches in the country in San Francisco, and he said this, It is necessary, therefore, for the privileged and the underprivileged to work on the common environment for the purpose of providing normal experiences of fellowship. This, one very important reason for the, this is one very important reason for the insistence that segregation is a complete ethical and moral evil. Whatever it may do for those who dwell on either side of the wall, one thing is certain, it poisons all normal contacts of those persons involved. The first step toward love is a common sharing of a sense of mutual worth and value. This cannot be discovered in a vacuum or in a series of artificial or hypothetical relationships. It has to be in a real situation, natural, and free. That's how Howard Thurman made a case for integrating the church. And it's interesting, he integrated the church just a few decades before Holy Communion became an integrated church. Thurman would argue that an integrated church, where black and white, where people of different races and economic backgrounds worship together, it's one of the primary reasons for a church to exist. Stanley Hauerwas, a theologian at Duke, has put it this way. The church does not exist to provide an ethos for democracy or any other form of social organization, but stands as a political alternative to every nation, witnessing to the kind of social life possible for those that have been formed by the story of Christ. Basically, there are theologians that tell us that to be a part of a church, to really be a member of a church is to be a part of a community that witnesses that what's going on around us in society isn't healthy, isn't normal, isn't what God would have. And that the role of the church is to witness to a different way that a different life is possible for those who have been, in the words of Hauerwas, formed by the story of Christ. 
So this gets into the question of how do we prioritize belonging? It takes us back to that question that Brene Brown asked. And it's a question I know a lot of us have been struggling with in COVID. What is it meant to be part of a church when we couldn't just go to church on Sunday morning, when we couldn't just go through the motions, when going to church meant staying in our pajamas, maybe drinking our coffee and flipping open our laptop? What does it mean to belong? I think in the post-COVID world, we're going to have to answer that question for ourselves. And I think a lot of us have been working on that answer for a while now. What is the role of church in our society? And what is the role of the church in our own lives? What do we give up to belong? We have this conversation sometimes with our children and family ministries, particularly because we hear a lot from parents, especially, I'm feeling it as a new parent, how many things there are going on Sunday mornings. And it's, it's the normal thing to rail against soccer games and soccer schedules, right? But our kids are very, very programmed. I mean, we, we talk about, Putnam says that we don't belong, but in some ways our kids belong more than kids have ever belonged. Uh, they've got more dance classes, they've got more extracurriculars going. But I wonder how strong those connections are. And sometimes I wonder how much does all of that doing give us what Brene Brown talks about in terms of belonging, that sense of that we belong to a community where we matter, that sense of belonging to ourselves. And so there's a bit of a challenge in this for me, and I, I can't say that I have the exact answer but what does it mean to belong to a church? I don't think it's necessarily something your priest can answer for you. I think it's something that you have to answer for yourself. Your level of feeling like you belong is going to match your level of commitment. It's going to match the amount of time that you put in, the relationships that you put in. It's been a hard chunk of time for the church. In many ways, a lot of the defaults, a lot of the ways we gathered have been impossible. But as we take our next steps forward, if you're having a hard time with this question of belonging, of membership, I'd invite you to lean in. One of our members, somebody who's been a part of lots of committees and programs at Holy Communion, uh, Helen Burton, I've quoted her before on this, but she likes to say that belonging to it, to belong to a church, to really feel like you belong to a church, you got to do what she called worship plus two. You got to come on Sundays. And we know that not everybody can be there every Sunday. You know, the church says you can come three times a year and it totally counts. But you got to worship with some regularity to belong, to feel like you belong. And then Helen said, you got to do two more things. For her, a lot of the time, it was choir and either vestry or stewardship committee. But you got to find two things. If you're having a hard time finding the two things, if you're looking for ways to belong and you haven't found them quite yet, I'd invite you, get together with me, get together with Julie, get together with Chester. Let's talk. Let's find some ways for you to find your plus two. But we're all going to be in this, in the midst of this, what does it mean to belong? What does it mean to be a member? What are our commitments? And I would invite you to do that, not by default, but to think about how do you want to build community? How can you be a part of a community that witnesses to a different way of being? Our mission statement calls us a welcoming, diverse community seeking to follow Jesus. Basically, we don't think you can follow Jesus all on your own. It takes a village. So what are the ways in which you are going to choose to belong? What are the ways you're going to lean in? I look forward to talking with those, uh, talking about those with you. So for those of you who are able, we're going to gather uh, Sunday morning, 5th of December, 9 a.m. Looks like the weather's going to be nice. Uh, sit out on the front lawn of Holy Communion. If it's not raining, if it is, we'll find space inside. We'll keep our masks on. But we can talk about this. We can talk about Q&A. And if you can't make it at 9 o'clock on Sunday, don't worry. 
I'd love to engage you around these questions. I know a number of people who would love to engage you around these questions of belonging and meaning. And if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, I really do want to explore that sacramental membership in the church. Uh, in early 2022, uh, we are going to be kicking off a pilgrimage class. I'll make sure that the sign up is available at holycommunion.net backslash info. Uh, we'd love to have you be a part of exploring membership in a sacramental way at Holy Communion. Thanks so much, uh, and I look forward to talking with you.